Hello everybody and welcome to the wine cast. It's back to a wine region with this cast and the region I'll be covering, New Zealand, is an important player in the world wine market despite its small size and strong commitment to one particular grape variety. So let's have a look at New Zealand. Though New Zealand is an important wine producing region now, its relationship to the grape has been tortured at times. The first vines of Vitis vinifera were planted there in 1819, but proper wine wouldn't be made until around 1836, thanks to the efforts of James Busby, the British viticulturalist who also played a huge role in the development of the Australian wine industry. It wasn't long after Busby's efforts that the first permanent winery, the Mission Estate, founded by French Catholic missionaries in 1851, and still in existence today, began production. As happened in so many other places, though, phylloxera dealt the New Zealand wine industry a sharp blow. But the effects of phylloxera, devastating enough on their own, were compounded by the decision of most kiwi growers to combat the bug by planting Vitis labrusca vines and hybrids of American grapes and Vitis vinifera, rather than by grafting vinifera scions onto American rootstocks. New Zealand wasn't the only New World nation to go down this route. If you remember the cast on Uruguay, you'll know the same decision was made there, and also, like Uruguay, New Zealand spent most of the 20th century producing lackluster wines whose lack of complexity had a dampening effect on the growth of the industry there. So much so, in fact, that it's really very accurate to describe New Zealand drink culture as a beer and cocktail culture rather than a wine culture for the greater part of the 20th century. But just distinguishing between a preference for beer and spirits versus wine doesn't do justice to the struggles that not just the wine industry but any alcohol industry faced in New Zealand because, like the U.S. this time, New Zealand was long plagued by an aggressive temperance movement during the 19th and well into the 20th century. Thankfully, this movement never realized its goal of national prohibition, but between 1894 and 1908, it did manage to convince 12 of New Zealand's 76 regional districts to vote themselves dry, with some of them remaining so for decades. New Zealand almost went dry in 1919, with 49.7% of the vote going in that direction that year, but after that failure, most Kiwis decided to have a look at America's experiment with national prohibition to see how that would turn out. The general judgment, both in the U.S. and New Zealand, was that it didn't turn out so well, and the temperance movement never came that close to passing national prohibition in New Zealand again. But even though the movement was dead in some ways, it still cast a long shadow. And to take just one example, Kiwis had to deal with 50 years of a law that closed bars and taverns at 6 p.m., yep, 6 p.m., and led to an almost daily ritual known colloquially as the 6 o'clock swill, where patrons would flood bars when the day shift let out at 5 p.m. and drink for an hour before they closed at 6. Things were looking up by the 1970s for the wine industry, though, with bars and taverns not only staying open later after the end of the swill in 1967, but as New Zealand's trade relationship with Britain and other nations evolved, leading to less demand for New Zealand canned meat products, Kiwis were interested in finding valuable cash crops that could be grown in marginal areas that weren't currently being used for agriculture, so as to leave existing industries unaffected. And nothing loves a marginal growing area more than a grape. And it would be one particular grape that really stood out in the growing regions of New Zealand. That grape was, and still is, Sauvignon Blanc. Though it wouldn't become obvious until the 1980s when several key New Zealand producers put the local expression of this grape on the map, there does seem to be something about New Zealand that makes Sauvignon Blanc sing, creating at its best a remarkably powerful and vibrant expression that some people find too much, but at least as many people find revelatory. New Zealand's commitment to this grape is profound, with currently a little over 22,000 hectares, or around 53,000 acres, under vine, meaning that it accounts for 59% of all grapes planted, a really large percentage for a major wine-producing nation, and for 76% of all white grapes planted. But Sauv Blanc isn't the only game in town, and it's followed by Pinot Noir, another disproportionately represented varietal that makes up to 72% of red plantings, and then by Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Merlot, Riesling, and Syrah, as well as around another 29 white grapes and 23 reds. But reds and whites aren't equally divided in New Zealand, and as of 2017, about 79% of New Zealand production is white. Speaking of overall production, in terms of volume, that is, hectoliters or gallons of wine produced, New Zealand is not a major player in the world industry. In fact, it usually clocks in at around 27th or 28th in terms of by-volume production. 
But if you consider dollar value of exports, all of that changes, and New Zealand comes in at seventh worldwide, just behind the U.S., in fact, for value of exports, usually exporting around 1.1 billion U.S. dollars worth of wine. In fact, the average dollar value per bottle of New Zealand wine is often among the highest in the world. Yes, there aren't any New Zealand bottles as expensive as culty California cabs or high-end Grand Cru Burgundies, but the average dollar value of New Zealand wines remains high because the literal rivers of cheap wine produced in France and California, and Australia and Spain and Italy for that matter, that drag the average dollar value down in those countries aren't a thing in New Zealand. In many ways, it's best to think of New Zealand as a giant, as in nation-sized, boutique producer of wine. And where is all this wine grown? Well, New Zealand is divided between two islands, the imaginatively named North and South Islands, and though much unites their production culture, there are some key differences. The North Island, with its relative proximity to the equator, is the warmer and wetter of the two, and the one on which you're most likely to see red production. It produces about 40% of the country's wine. It contains six of the country's ten major wine regions, the most important of which are Auckland, a warm and very wet area that does well with reds like Syrah and Merlot, but also struggles with vine diseases like fungus and rot. Auckland has five sub-regions for wine production, the best known of which is the Waiheke Island, with a good reputation for high-quality reds. Gisborne is known for its whites, with over half the plantings dedicated to Chardonnay that, thanks to warm westerly winds, will tend to express toward the tropical fruit end of things. It's also known for its Gewurztraminer, Viognier, and Pinot Gris. Hawke's Bay is another warm spot, with one of its two sub-regions, the Gimblet Gravels, particularly well known for its red Bordeaux varietals, as well as Syrah. This sub-region has unique soil composition based on gravel, no surprise, and a sedimentary sandstone called Grey Whack that provides good drainage and heat retention. Wairarapa, at the very south end of the North Island, has a sub-region called Martinborough that has a stellar reputation for its Pinot Noir. Northland and the Waikato Bay of Plenty regions round out the North Island's wine-producing areas. The South Island is cooler than the North Island, with most vineyards lying between 40 and 45 degrees south latitude, making the South Island home to the most southerly vineyards in the world. Most of the South Island's four wine regions lie east of a central mountain range, dubbed the Southern Alps in English, and more elegantly in the local Maori language, Katiritiri Otemoana, that creates a rain shadow that leaves most South Island wine regions not just cooler, but drier than their North Island counterparts as well. On the South Island, Marlborough, which is home to around 90% of the country's Sauvignon Blanc, has two sub-regions, the Waira River Valley and the Awatri Valley, with the former being known for warmer, more tropical expressions of Sauvignon Blanc, and the latter for cooler, more herbaceous expressions. Canterbury is also known for Sauvignon Blanc and for Pinot Noir as well, and its Wipera Valley sub-region can lay claim to some well-regarded Rieslings. The central Otago, thanks to its inland location surrounded by mountains, has the closest thing to a true continental climate in the otherwise maritime climate of New Zealand. Thanks to its southerly location, the days are long here during the growing season, and that helps to ripen the Pinot Noir that makes up a large majority of its plantings. But there's also a good diurnal temperature range here during the growing season with warm days and cool nights, and that helps to keep acid levels high in the Pinot. Nelson, at the northwest corner of the island, known for its Sauvignon Blanc, rounds out the South Island's four major wine regions. Finally, how does wine law work in New Zealand? Pretty straightforwardly, in fact. Like its neighbor about 1,100 miles to the west, Australia, New Zealand follows the so-called Rule of 85, with an 85% threshold to use a vintage date, specify a single varietal, or identify the wine by a region of origin. All told, there are 10 major wine regions in New Zealand that we've covered in our survey of both islands and a total of 42 sub-regions that can appear as geographic designations on bottles. Otherwise, except for basic health and safety regulations, both viticulture and winemaking in New Zealand, as in many parts of the New World, are largely unregulated. Thanks for joining me for another Winecast. Though that was a lot of information I threw at you, it's far from the whole story of New Zealand wine, and I hope to return to New Zealand as a subject in future casts. If this cast was enjoyable or helpful to you, hopefully both, then please like and subscribe if you haven't already, and please say hi or leave a question or request in the comments. I'm always glad to hear from all of you. 
I'm your host, the Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.